Okay, well, thanks for the invitation to uh, speak to you from a very long way away. First of all, the slides today, we'll share around these, uh, the slides later so you can get to them, uh, play around with some of the links and try some of the stuff that's, uh, that's in there. So, I mean, I suppose I should start uh, by talking about what I mean by hacking. Uh, no, I'm not after your credit card details. Um, I'm talking about hacking in the, the positive sense of, of using code uh, to find a way around problems, to um, improve the way that systems work. When I'm talking about hacking, I often uh, refer to um, a quote by the uh, digital humanities scholar uh, Mark Olson, um, that a hack can be elegant or kludgy, authored from scratch or patched together and remixed. The important thing is getting things done, pushing the boundary of what the humanities can do, what it affects, what effects it can have in the world and where. And really that's the sort of sentiment that motivates what I do, and, you know, getting things done, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with code um, and specifically relating to uh, online collections. Uh, what we can do with online collections by, by fiddling around, playing, uh, working against the grain in some senses to, to open up collections in different sorts of ways. And I suppose specifically um, I'm interested in Hacking is a way of exploring the meaning of access um, as it applies to uh, gland collections online. Um, I mean, we often talk about access as if it's some sort of binary, right? Open or closed. But of course, there's all sorts of ways that, that online access can be filtered or constrained. Um, you know, access is constructed. I mean, it's constructed by technology, by history, by funding, by institutional practices. Uh, even by commercial interests. Um, and hacking glam collections, and I'm going to show lots of examples of what I mean by this, is a way of understanding how they've been constructed, of peeking around inside and exploring their limits. Um, and if there are problems, of trying to find possible workarounds. So let's, let's dive into an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, a problem and a workaround. Okay, so I do a lot of work with Trove, which is the National Library of Australia's uh, discovery service. Um, and you may uh, have heard of Trove, particularly in relation to its digitised newspapers. Um, there's over now 220 million uh, digitised newspaper articles in Trove. And, you know, it's changed the practice of history, for example, in ways that we don't really yet understand. Um, but uh, there's all sorts of other stuff in Trove as well. And... Uh, in particular, there is um, a growing amount of, of uh, digitised content that's not newspapers. For example, uh, various magazines and journals. Um, and that's, uh, I think there's uh, several hundred of those now which have been digitised and made available, but they're not available where the newspapers are. They're in a separate section with all sorts of other stuff. So they can be quite difficult to find at times. So I thought I'd try and do something about that to find a way of actually featuring that digital content and making it a bit easier to use. I mean, in particular, it has until recently been very difficult to search within a particular journal. So what I did was um, I used uh, the Trove API, Application Programming Interface, a way of getting data out of the back end of Trove. So I used the API to harvest information about the digitized journals. Um, and I created my own interface. Uh, and it's a little application, it sits there, people uh, make use of it, and it allows people to see, first of all, a list of the digitized journals, but it also enables them with a click to search inside those journals. It basically takes them back to Trove to do the searching, but it constructs the search for them because it's not something you can easily do through Trove's uh, main web interface. Um, so, uh, basically, by creating this application, I've given people a, a new way, a different way of accessing that material on Trove. Um, and it's now actually possible, there's been some upgrades in recent months, uh, so that you can limit your searches by a particular journal, so search inside a particular journal. Um, so in some senses, my hack here has been superseded, uh, although I did a little Twitter poll and people were keen to see it continue. Um, but if it is superseded, you know, that's great. Uh, it's not intended to be a long-term substitute. Um, these sorts of things to me are, are interventions. You know, they raise questions uh, and they expose possibilities. Now, um, the problem that, you know, I was, I was hacking around in terms of this example uh, was 
uh, you know, that question of how do you get access to something if you, if you don't know it's there? Um, and it's a pre pretty familiar way in which access is constrained. Um, but there are a few others which um, I come across pretty regularly. And they're things like this. So there's the, the what is available, you know, what's there. Um, there's also questions about, you know, is it in the form that I need? Is it in the form that I have to have it in order to use it the way I want to? Do I have the technical skills in order to get the data out, to be able to, to do things with it? And in the end, what does it all really mean? How do I make sense of all this data? So these sort of things, these sorts of questions in themselves, um, constrain access by creating all sorts of limits around the way we, uh, we find and use uh, cultural heritage resources, GLAM resources. So let's start diving into some of those. So what's available? You know that question, well, where do I start? Um, so Trove, uh, my Trove digitized journals thing is an example where I've created, uh, you know, a, a separate interface, a different web application in order to use it. Um, and there are, you know, other examples out there of people uh, building new interfaces to cultural collections, particularly sort of generous uh, type interfaces, which, which put the content up front so that people have a way into it. Um, so that's, that's one approach of creating those sorts of, um, um, those sorts of alternative interfaces. But there are other ways that we can surface content as well, enable people to sort of see what's down there amongst the, 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 the collection. Um, I'm a big fan of randomness, um, of actually pulling stuff at random from cultural heritage collections uh, and, and using them, displaying them, sharing them. Um, just the sort of serendipitous power of, uh, of pulling stuff out that uh, we don't expect or that we're not looking for just to see what happens. Uh, recently, um, uh, there was a change with the, the Trove API, which meant that um, I, have to, I had to uh, uh, sort of re-engineer the way that I was getting random items from Trove. And, and on the screen, there, there's some examples that I've been developing recently in terms of getting uh, different types of random material. Um, but what can you do with that? Well, uh, one way is um, sharing it in different contexts. So, uh, Trove Newsbot is a Twitter bot that has been going now for, oh, well, no, it's got there, joined June 2013, so he's been uh, going for at least five years now, uh, six years. Um, and uh, what Trove Newsbot does is shares random newspaper articles from Trove, um, and that's using that sort of random uh, examples of code that I was uh, showing before. Um, but Trove Newsbot actually does some other stuff as well. Um, so it, uh, unlike uh, uh, some other bots, Trove Newsbot will respond to your query. So you can actually tweet queries at Trove Newsbot and uh, it will search Trove for you and send you back the most relevant result. Um, if you append the hashtag lucky dip, you will get the most you'll get a random result from your search. Um, so there's various ways like that you can interact with it. And in fact, um, Trove Newsbot, um, although it's just using the Trove search index underneath, of course, uh, actually um, extends the functionality of Trove somewhat because you can actually send a URL to Trove Newsbot and Trove Newsbot will uh, extract keywords from the page at the end of that URL and then search for those. And that's not something you can do within the, the, uh, the normal Trove web interface. Um, I mean, I like bots. I like uh, because of the, the the way that they actually take collections to the places where people are. So they open up access in interesting ways. In ways, you know, open up access to people who don't visit your website, who may not even know who you are, have never heard of you, by putting that stuff out there in sort of social spaces where people congregate. There's that possibility for people to discover you. But ways of um, <clears throat> bringing content to the surface of making people aware of what's there, of, of hacking those sorts of possibilities, don't have to be complex. You know, it can be as simple as creating a list of stuff, right? In this case, I've looked at um, data sets which are being shared by GLAM institutions in Australia, and they're being shared through a platform known as data.gov.eu, which is an open government data portal. And it's fabulous um, that they're sharing all of these data sets, but they're actually not very easy to find. First of all, you have to know that they are at, at a, in a government data portal, which might not be the first place you go looking for data coming from a library. And then even when you get there, there's difficulties around the, the way the institutions are described, which makes it difficult to find. 
So in this case, I went to that portal, I found all the institutions, and then I used their API to pull out data about all those data sets, uh, aggregate it together, um, create a, a nice human readable list. Um, and there's also a machine readable list as well. So a, a spreadsheet, a CSV file, which you can access if you want um, inform the data in that sort of form. So it's just a list. But as you can see there, um, there's, uh, I think there's around 500 CSV files amongst those data sets which are being shared. And of those, uh, most of them, as you can see, have open licenses. So there's great opportunities for working with that data. Um, and, you know, it, it's mainly a case of people just knowing, not knowing that it's there. And the sort of things we're talking about here are, for example, indexes, which might be created to particular sets of records. So people... Uh, staff and volunteers have gone in and transcribed names and dates, etc., from different sets of records, and they've been saved in a spreadsheet and made available. So there's some really useful data there. So even creating a list can hack access, can change the way uh, we, uh, we are able to use this material online. But in this case, you know, creating this list, seeing that there are 500 CSV files, of course, makes you wonder, well, what's actually in all those CSV files? I mean, I mean, you've gone one step further in knowing that they exist, but then that question of, you know, what's inside these files? So I've created this tool here, which enables you, gives you a sort of preview of what's in any of the CSV files. You can actually, if you've got a CSV file online, you can actually uh, plug it into this and it will do the same thing for, for your CSV file. Um, <clears throat> and what it's doing is basically looking at all the, uh, the columns in your spreadsheet. Um, and it's seeing what sort of data is in those columns, uh, whether it's numeric data or whether it's, uh, it's text data, whether it's categories. Uh, and then based on that assessment, it's creating a series of visualizations. It's showing you the range of values and things like that. So it's basically just giving you a little preview of every column in that spreadsheet. So it's quite a handy way of, of if you're uh, if you're approaching that sort of collection and want to get a sense of what is in those things, just just to uh, to select them and get a quick picture of what's inside. My next sort of question, you know, problem where uh, I often end up hacking stuff uh, around cultural heritage collections, is this problem of is it in the form that I need? I mean, just because something's online doesn't mean you can actually use it the way that you want to use it, right? Um, I mean, I know in this webinar series that questions about copyright and licensing have come up pretty regularly, and that, that's one way in which use is limited. Um, you might, I mean, another sort of obvious example, I suppose, would be uh, the uh, resolution of images for download. You know, um, if there are low resolution images, what you can do with them is, is limited in various ways. And there are other sorts of ways where the way material is presented online actually restricts what we're able to do with it. So uh, this is um, uh, Australian Hansard. So it's the, the, the proceedings of the Australian Parliament, all the speeches that were made in the Australian Parliament. Um, and it's made available uh, by the Parliamentary Library and you can go in and search it. Um, and the Parliamentary Library has done a lot of fabulous work in um, uh, taking those, uh, the volumes, the printed volumes from, uh, in this case, it's from 1901 onwards because that's when Australia became Australia in 1901. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's scanned them, it's, it's OCR'd them, and it's um, marked them up as, as really nicely structured XML files. So, so uh, it's really good data, you know. You know, us metadata nerds, we get really excited about nicely structured XML. Um, and um, so that's great, that's fabulous. The problem is that the search interface is really horrible. Um, and it's really hard to actually, uh, even once you've found something, to, to read it in context. You just get a little snippet. Um, uh, and the other uh, issue is, and while it's got those great XML files underneath it, uh, and you can actually uh, download the XML files, you can only do it one day at a time. Uh, so one sitting day at a time, there's an XML file, you can click it and you can download it. But of course, something like Hansard opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities for doing analysis at scale, for looking at, you know, 80, 100 years of, of political speech uh, and doing interesting types of, of text analysis on it. But that's not possible the way it's presented online. 
So what I did is I basically wrote a little computer script to harvest all of the XML files, um, thousands of them, and um, I put them in a, a, a GitHub repository, so they're all now accessible, um, and you can download them all at once if you want to. Um, I mean, there's many gigabytes of text here, but um, it is possible for you to download them and then to do that sort of large scale analysis on them. So again, and I'll keep saying this throughout the talk, access has changed. Uh, what you can do with them now, now that they're sitting in that GitHub repository, is different to what you could do with them sitting in that search interface from the parliamentary library. Um, and once I had them out as XML files, I thought, well, I might as well create my own interface. So uh, I created my own version of Historic Hansard. This is 1901 to 1980. Um, and it's really simple. And again, you know, these things don't have to be complex um, because the main complaint people had was just uh, lacking that ability to read a particular speech in the context of a full day's proceedings. So all I've done is basically created one page for every sitting day, just an HTML page. Um, so not exciting at all, but you can actually read the whole day's proceedings, which you couldn't do in the, the search interface. So simple things like that can really change the way you can use stuff. Now, one of, I mentioned, well, I mean, Hansard was an example where, uh, you know, I brought all these little bits of content together uh, to enable new types of use. But uh, also sometimes, you know, splitting apart large resources can do the same thing, change how we use them, make new possibilities available. Um, in this case, um, the Bulletin uh, is one of those journals which is being digitised by Trove. Uh, it was a very influential uh, journal in Australia and it ran from the 1880s through to the 1980s and it's being digitised that whole run. So 100 years of the Bulletin uh, is in the process of being digitised. Um, it's not always pleasant reading. The Bulletin uh, was well known for its support of the White Australia policy, for example. So even just in these images you can see at the moment, uh, they were often uh, quite racist, anti-Semitic, uh, they were anti-Labor. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a reflection of, but you know, it is a reflection of the politics of the time. Um, so all these fabulous digitized resources being made available through Trove. Um, but there's just so much of it, again. Um, I mean, the Bulletin was actually very well known for these sorts of full page editorial cartoons, often done by qu quite well known artists. Um, but if you want to find them, you basically have to go through each issue, uh, you know, with the sort of page turnery thing, try and find them, and then you could download them if you found them. What I did was I found a way of identifying where these cartoons were uh, within the Bulletin. It took a lot of trial and error. Um, uh, and once I'd done that, I basically ran through and uh, harvested out all of these editorial cartoons. So I've got a collection now of 3,471 of these sorts of, of editorial cartoons, and that's at least one every day uh, for between, I think it's 1886 and 1953, so covering you know, a large uh, portion of Australian history. So I've harvested them. They're, they're quite... Uh, reasonably high resolution uh, JPEG files. Um, they can download the whole lot if they want to. Um, so if a, uh, a scholar wanted to uh, use sort of computer vision to analyze the full range of images, they could do that. But in doing this, I also knew that there were other groups who were going to be really interested in this, who weren't necessarily very uh, technically savvy. Um, I mean, teachers and students are, are, are uh, one of the, the main groups there, you know, who uh, make use of these sorts of resources all the time in the studies of Australian history. So I decided in this case, I mean, most of my time I spend sort of pulling PDFs apart and trying to get data out of PDFs. But in this case, I compiled the images into PDFs, um, specifically so that teachers and students could just download them and browse through them and make use of them very easily. And so that's what I've done. So this whole lot is now, so there's uh, one PDF per decade. Uh, they can download it and, and uh, just use them that way. And they all have links to the issue in Trove as well, so they can go and find that in context. Um, 
And I think that's really interesting uh, in terms of the nature of access in that, you know, sometimes it is those sorts of uh, basic familiar technologies that PDF can actually, you know, change access to these sorts of resources. And this was just a, a quote which I noticed um, from uh, uh, one of the curators at the National Library um, who was putting together a, a, um, an exhibition on cartoons, um, noting that previously this kind of research would have taken months, but now thanks to Tim's shortcut, read hack, uh, can be done in a matter of days. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's the sort of thing I'm trying to achieve. Other sources of data, I mean, places like the National Archives of Australia, that's the NAA, they have fabulous metadata describing their collections, their files. Um, but they don't have any way of getting access to the raw data. There's no API as there is in Trove. They don't make a lot of downloads available. So if you actually want to get data out of their online database, and they do have an online database, it's all there online, you actually have to, uh, what's called screen scraping. You actually have to try and extract the data from uh, normal web pages. So I've created a screen scraper, which works on their online database and enables people to pull out uh, data from their from search results and save them as you know a spreadsheet, as a CSV file. Um, and you can also uh, not just download the metadata, if files have been digitized, you can also grab any uh, of the images of the digitized files. So you can download huge amounts of uh, data from record search. Um, and it's available as a, a sort of standalone tool if you want to use it to harvest metadata, but I also sort of have embedded it in a range of other projects where I'm working with collections from the National Archives. I suppose my point here is that, that access is not all about, uh, you know, sort of shiny interfaces, sort of generated, generous interfaces or something like that. That a, a CSV file or, or a PDF file uh, might be transformative in the context of a specific use or a specific audience. Um, you know, even in those sorts of simple cases, the nature of access changes. New possibilities emerge. So... APIs are cool, but who are they for? I mean, APIs enable us to get, you know, as I said, data out of the back end of these systems and do things, develop new systems, create new interfaces, do all sorts of exciting stuff. But you need to have some knowledge in order to use them. I mean, if you look at most API documentation, um, you know, you'd probably assume that APIs are, are just for developers, right? But what about a researcher who wants to, for example, visualize collection metadata or harvest large amounts of content for uh, analysis? Access in that sort of case is not limited by, you know, what's available online, but by the, the person who wants to, to get the material by their technical skills. Or, or even before that, it might be limited by their understanding of what such skills makes possible. I mean, why invest in learning to do a bit of coding if you don't have a sense of what the payback from that might be? Why learn to use an API? When I start to talk about this sort of question with people, um, I often go uh, to examples like this, um, which is a way of, uh, it uses the Trove API basically to visualize a search in Trove's newspaper zone. Uh, and in this case, I'm searching for three different terms. So radio, you can see in blue, telegraph in orange, uh, wireless in red. Um, and it's not a, a not a, it doesn't show us anything uh, too exciting. Um, although you can see, of course, the, the, the technological shift there. Um, but the point is that, you know, you can't do that in the web interface with a normal list of search results, right? It's only by getting that data out of the API, and in this case we're using uh, the, the available facets of decade and year, to be able to build a chart like this, which shows us the number of newspaper articles which contain each of those terms per year. So this enables us to see the whole of a search. You know, it may be 3 million results. In fact, that search for radio, there's over 3 million results there. Um, there's no way we could look, look at that by scrolling through a, a set of search results, but we can visualize it in this sort of way. It enables us to frame different sorts of questions. Now, this example here that, that you can see is actually embedded uh, within a Jupyter notebook. Um, and 
the Jupyter Notebook actually works through a whole series of examples like this, showing how you can use facets uh, in order to uh, basically slice and dice the search results to visualize them in different types of ways. So in this case, we're comparing search terms. You might do a, a comparison between Australian states like New South Wales and Victoria. You might do a, a comparison between different newspapers to see how the coverage of a particular term varies between those newspapers. So I've got a, I've got a, a notebook there which enables you to shows you walks you through all those examples. And my aim there is both to give people an idea of of how you do it in terms of the code and things like that, but also you know why you would be interested in this. Why am I interested in an API? The sorts of things that you can do, the sorts of possibilities they raise when you can get that data out. Now, probably a lot of you are wondering, what is this thing called a Jupyter Notebook? Basically, Jupyter Notebooks, um, are, they're, they're widely used in the data sciences, uh, and they enable you to combine uh, text and live code um, and uh, run it in your web browser. Um, and they're a great way of learning what's possible in code, because you can have those live examples there. Now, say we've started with something like this, uh, uh, this sort of visualization, we find that, you know, an interesting point that we want to look at. Um, our next uh, step might be to uh, dive in a particular point in that chart and download lots of newspaper articles. Um, oh, that's the next one. That's the Jupyter, that's the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so, you know, APIs are good for getting data out, getting lots of data out. Um, but again, only if you know how, only if you can construct a bit of code which will loop through and make lots of requests and eventually save all that data for you. So I've created another hack here, a tool called the Trove Newspaper Harvester, which basically does that for you. Um, there are different versions of it, and this is the simplest. You basically put in your query, press the button, and it will harvest thousands, if you want, hundreds of thousands, uh, of newspaper articles from Trove. And that includes both the metadata and the full text of those newspaper articles. So you can take that full text uh, and do, um, uh, you know, large scale analysis, text analysis, uh, topic modeling, all that sort of stuff with it. These examples, the Trove Harvester, those uh, visualization examples, and a lot of the other things uh, that I've been talking about are actually collected now in uh, this, the GLAM workbench. Um, you know, one of the things I really love about Jupyter Notebooks uh, is their capacity to function both as a tool and as a tutorial. I mean, you can do real things. So in that case of the Trove Newspaper Harvester, you can actually just start harvesting newspaper articles. Um, you can do real things, um, and you can do that without any coding knowledge. But if you want to, you can dig into the details. You can have a look at the code underneath and start to understand how it works. Um, so... Many of these hacks are now uh, being collected into the, the GLAM workbench. The aim is to provide a, a whole range of new access points where people can start doing stuff with GLAM data. You know, it goes beyond documentation to provide real, live, useful, practical examples. So it's not a case of, look, here's an API, go away and play. Uh, it's, here's what you can do with this API. Here's an example of the sorts of questions that you can ask. And no, not only that, go away and try it yourself right now. It's live. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that some GLAM institutions are exploring the use of Jupyter for these sorts of reasons. Um, you know, not just providing an API, not just providing API documentation, but using Jupyter Notebooks as a way of giving people examples of what they can actually do with those APIs. And I think there's some really exciting possibilities ahead for playing around uh, with our ideas of access by using things like Jupyter Notebooks. But of course, come back to this question of, well, you know, what does it mean? Um, to me, the point of hacking heritage, of doing this sort of stuff, um, of exploring the limits of access in these sorts of ways, is to enable us to see things differently to ask different types of questions of our GLAM collections, um, to not be limited to browsing, you know, a list of search results on a web page. So here's another view of Trove. Uh, so I, those charts before, I was showing you a, a single, with particular search terms. This is everything. So these are all the newspaper articles in Trove, number of articles per year. So 
you may need to look at that and you have a few questions. Uh, I like to ask people when I give workshops, well, you know, uh, did something, this is 1915 here, so did something significant happen in 1915? Uh, you know, was there a reason why there might be more news or something? Um, and of course, people have various theories, mostly relating to, to World War I. Um, and I have to say, well, yes, it does relate to World War I, but not in the way you think. It relates to World War I because in the lead up to the centenary of World War I, it was decided to focus digitization resources on newspapers from the World War I era. I mean, Trove newspapers aren't finished. More stuff's being added all the time, right? So priorities are set at different times about what newspapers are going to be digitized. So at that point in time, it was decided to focus on World War I newspapers, and that's why we have this dramatic peak in 1915. You might also be wondering about this feature here. This, 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 uh, the arrow over here, which has got this sudden dramatic drop. This is what we call the copyright cliff of death. Yes, um, as with, of course, all glam collections, you know, there are limits on what can be made available because of copyright. Um, and basically, that's why after 1954, uh, uh, the amount of material in Trove drops away quite alarmingly. There is some material, this is by sort of special arrangement with publishers, which is still there, but they're sort of gross features. So this is what's sitting underneath that search box, right? When you type something into Trove to search for newspaper articles, this is what's sitting underneath. But you don't know that, do you? You don't know that this, this, set, of, this uh, uh, set of newspapers has been constructed in this sort of way. A sim another sort of example, so when I, I mentioned that I harvested all the uh, Hansard, for example, and when I did that, I noticed that there were some oddities in what I was harvesting. And I eventually figured out that about 90 sitting days were actually missing uh, from what the Parliamentary Library had put online. Um, and as you can see there, they're the red bits there. Uh, they're all focused, again, strangely enough, around the World War I period. Um, and um, it was just a failure in technology. Uh, it just hadn't been picked up before. Um, and I have to say, the Parliamentary Library were really responsive and they fixed all the problems. But at that, up to that point in time, if anybody was you know, researching the World War I period and was searching in the Senate, it was also concentrated in the Senate, they, were, they would just not have been finding this material. They just wouldn't have known it was there. There was no way through the existing search interface to, to see it in this sort of way. And uh, finally, this is, this is another big picture. This is the whole of the National Archives of Australia uh, with the, the, the files grouped by uh, their top level functions, the functions of government, as you can see, things like defence and immigration and transport. So in this picture here, you'll see we've got it uh, showing the number of items described. So the bubbles show the number of items described on, in their online database uh, according to those functions. And we can see you know, they're all sort of roughly the same sort of size. There's nothing that particularly stands out. But keep an eye on defence there as we go to the next slide. Um, this is the number of items digitised. So if we're looking at the National Archives of Australia in terms of what's been digitised, the picture is quite different. What we see is quite different. Defence is overrepresented. Uh, and I can point to a specific historical event which offers a large explanation for that. And again, it's to do with funding, uh, that the Australian government uh, put in dedicated funding for the digitisation of 345,000 World War I service records. And that uh, largely explains that sort of ballooning of defence. So things like that money spent on, on defence records, and we're about to see uh, that's going to get even bigger because uh, the government has announced that it's going to give them money to digitise World War II service records. Um, but, of course, the other thing that's shaping it too are the demands by family historians who are one of the largest groups using, or the largest group using these records. So immigration and defence records in particular are, are, are often digitised for those reasons. So, you know, I started off arguing that access is constructed, right? Uh, and these three views of this different these different collections show how the digital collections that we work with are the result of all manners of, of policies and practices, priorities, and even and even excellence. 
Most importantly, though, as I've said, these limits and biases can't be seen through the standard search interfaces that we use to access these collections. We can only see them this way if we're prepared to engage critically with the systems that deliver GLAM collections to our browser. If, instead of just consuming online resources, we start to hack them. And once we start doing that, we can ask other sorts of questions. We can ask, well, how does access change if I do that? What can I see differently? What is possible that wasn't possible before? And where can I go next? And this sort of expanding of horizons is really what open glam means to me. And thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for your inspiring presentation. Um, I think there have been amazing examples of um, how we can actually hack heritage. And um, I'd like to start with a question. Um, if you were asked um, for your recommendations um, for institutions that want to share their data, how should they model their data? What should they be aware of when they want to share their data to make it accessible um, and reusable for people that are engaged in the same activities as you are? Maybe your top five recommendations. Oh, top five. Um, uh, look, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, if you've got the resources to develop APIs, then um, APIs are great because of the flexibility they provide. Um, you know, there's... Uh, uh, but, you know, think about... Well, actually, let me roll back that, that question a bit. Because I don't think it's just about what the institutions can do either. Um, you know, I think this question of access and the reason why I do what I do is that it's, um, you know, th th there is collaboration around access, you know. Um, so in, an institution is never going to uh, create uh, sort of slices of, of data sets which suit particular audiences, you know, they're not... They're, they're not going to, um, you know, have the resources or know what those groups want in order to sort of provide nice, neatly packaged data sets that suit everybody. So then it's the responsibility of people like me who, who start to build these things to make sure that not only if we, we create these sort of little uh, data sets, um, that we also share them as well. Um, so we pass on that uh, access that we get. So it is always a collaborative thing. I mean, obviously... Good metadata is, is fabulous, but, um, you know, it's better to get stuff out there even if it's not perfect. Just, again, you know, um, people like me might come along and say, hey, there's a problem with your metadata. Uh, and uh, that should be a good thing, you know. Um, institutions should be really happy if that happens. Um, because, you know, they, they've made the effort, they've put it out there, and people have used it and have felt strongly enough to... to, to, uh, to to um, explore it and, and they've given you that sort of feedback um, which enables you to, to, uh, to improve it. I suppose too, and I'm just sort of reinforcing the message that was in that talk, is that um, I would like to see uh, institutions actually giving more examples. Um, like, you know, I'm, obviously I'm obsessed with Jupyter Notebooks at the moment. Um, but I do think those sorts of possibilities, not just putting data out there, but giving people an idea of what's in there and what they might be able to do with it. Because, you know, not because particularly, uh, you know, researchers wanting to access material, they not necessarily like me going to invest the time in actually digging inside all these things to find out what's there. So if you want people to use it, it's not just a matter of putting it online and saying, hey, there's a data set here. I mean, I think it's also a case of, of um, uh, uh, you know, helping them understand what benefit they might get from investing the time in understanding that data. Um, that's a very sort of waffly way of answering your question. But uh... Thank you very much. Um, I have another question. You said that collaboration is actually essential for hacking heritage and for your activities. So um, how would you like cultural heritage institutions develop relationships with audiences outside of their building and in the digital realm who want to use their data? Hmm, that's a tricky one. Um, I mean, I, uh, you know, one of the things which I struggle with, actually, is actually just 
um, you know, I can I can create things like with the Glam Workbench, for example, uh, which if you have a look at it, you'll see it features a number of collections, not just Trove and not just the National Archives. There's a number there, and I'll be adding uh, some more uh, shortly. Um, so I can create those things, but actually getting them uh, out to the people who might use them is difficult. Um, and I would actually really wish that institutions, the Glam institutions whose collections I use and I help other people use, actually just did a bit more in terms of sharing uh, that sort of stuff so that other people can find it. Uh, that's a bit of a bit of a bugbear with me at the moment. Um, uh, so, but it's, it is recognizing that, that, that it is a collaborative thing on both ends. And it doesn't have to be a formal collaboration. It doesn't have to be that you've discussed something and you're going to do it. But just recognize that if people are using your data and then sharing that, that they are contributing. Um, and, you know, you should be prepared to uh, promote that, to share it, to, uh, uh, um, you know, even if it's not a, a, a sort of um, a, a formal product, uh, or, or anything like that, you know, I think there are great opportunities um, uh, for, for just, you know, working, sharing uh, these sorts of examples so that, that more people can start doing it. Um, because, again, you know, it's in the, in the interests of the institutions. You know, if, what frustrates me sometimes is that, you know, institutions will, you know, have an API or they'll have a data set uh, and then they'll, you know, get disappointed because not many people are actually making use of it. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, it, it's that whole sort of effort around that, the data, which we've got to encourage and foster in all sorts of ways. And like I say, the work is not just for the institutions, but, um, you know, I think we can do better in terms of just, you know, um, developing those networks and, and, and communicating what's happening uh, um, you know, it, yeah, just just to get that um, uh, uh, to get all that happening, you know, in, in different sorts of communities, to get it out there into the groups who are actually going to make use of these things, um, you know, particular areas of history or, or social science or whatever, who might benefit from having access to these things and don't really know about them. Um, it's not the institution's job to go out there necessarily and talk to those groups, but they can certainly share examples of that sort of work where it becomes available. Thank you, Tim. I'm curious, you also included examples of digital humanities research based on cultural heritage institutions' data. Um, what is your perspective? Is the GLAM sector already using this, these kinds of me methods and are they seeing the chances of them? Oh, I certainly think they are. Um, I mean, there are obviously some instances where, uh, you know, people like me do work which sort of enriches metadata um, and you know, there's a possibility for that to be fed back into systems. And there's a couple of examples in Australia where, where that has happened. Um, but um, you know, I you know, I certainly know of of a number of experiments around the place where people are looking at um, well, it's not necessarily digital communities, but you know, looking at uh, you know image tagging or or uh, text analysis, all those sorts of things in terms of uh, generating useful metadata for their collections. Um, and there's places like in Australia, uh, you know, there's, you know, um, the, the whole Glam Labs movement, which is happening, which are, you know, sites for experimentation within Glam organisations. Um, and in Australia, we have a, a really active uh, um, and innovative group at the State Library of New South Wales called the DX Lab. Um, and they all do, do, you know, really great stuff. They, they collaborate uh, with, with all sorts of different people, um, develop a, a range of prototypes for finding and browsing their their collections, um, and they've just and they've got a a, a, a sort of fellowship scheme, uh, so you can uh, go in there and work with them on a project. Um, and I think their latest fellowship is uh, going to be exploring uh, possibilities of sort of machine learning and automated image tagging across uh, their photographic collections. Um, so um, yeah, it's great to see that sort of work uh, going on. Um, and I think, yeah, in particular, the sort of the, the, the whole Glam Lab thing, providing those sort of sites for experimentation. And I know you have great examples in, in Europe as well um, of where that's happening. Um, so those, they, they provide real um, points of focus for this sort of work to happen and, and should enable that sort of collaboration between uh, sort of digital humanities types and other 
uh, hacker types uh, uh, should provide a real focus for that sort of work to happen. Thank you very much, Tim, um, for your amazing presentation. And uh, thank you especially for all these inspiring examples. Thank you.